Happy Saturday, Risers. Sagar and I are back with some of our favorite moments from the week. That's right. First, we've got author Ryan Gerdusky react to Steve Bannon's claims that Ivanka was a strong populist in the White House and explains why her Senate run would be a disastrous move for her. Let's take a listen. Well, presidential pardons aren't cheap, and they cost you your dignity, apparently. So, <laughs> I mean... It's not true. It's not true in the slightest. Ivanka wasn't the most populist. She did one populist thing, I think, her entire time, which was she advocated for increasing child tax credits, which is great. And she did do that successfully. Mm -hmm. And her sponsor in the Senate was Rubio. Uh, Rubio and Ivanka worked really close on a lot of like child uh, tax credit issues. So uh, it, it strikes me as odd. I mean, I've heard the rumors before the reports came out that Ivanka was looking at creating some kind of political future for herself, maybe running directly in 2024. Uh, the problem for Ivanka is no party wants to have her. Uh, she's not conservative enough for Republican. She's not. Uh, she's a Trump, so that will kick her out of the Democrat Party. And I mean, I think it's this looming belief by most people that this sequel will be a lot more like Grease 2 than The Godfather 2. <laughs> <Ryan's hilarious. laughs> well, Ryan, Ryan always brings the fire. I love it. <laughs> Absolutely. It's interesting, though. I mean, yeah. I think she could probably do pretty well in a Republican primary down in Florida, even even against Marco Rubio, who I think is pretty popular. But we'll see if they're actually serious about that. <laughs> um, at the same time, Bernie Sanders is out with a big uh, stimulus plan of his own that could be passed through reconciliation. He's been sort of leading the charge there. What does all of that mean for progressives in the Biden era? We had politics reporter The Daily Beast, Hannah Trudeau, join us to discuss. But I think on the the, um, the the discussions going on revolving the check, I mean, it's something that clearly the left has been able to um, twist Biden's arm on a little bit. It didn't take too much for him to kind of come around to that idea, I think, on his own. But I do think that he's looking to Bernie as somebody that can be influential in some of these behind the scenes decisions. Obviously, he announced the other day that um, he considered him very strongly for uh, labor secretary. Um, and then they both decided that given the slim majority in the Senate that they would, uh, that he would be best to, to stay in Vermont. Um, but it, it's clear that, you know, the very minimum that they have an open line of communication, uh, you know, between them and I, and from talking to both of their teams, it seems, it seems to me that Biden is at least willing to um, engage in that kind of debate and his, his transition is willing to engage in that kind of debate um, with those on the left, especially uh, in response to the pandemic in particular. Color me skeptical that Bernie was ever seriously considered <laughs> for a labor secretary. But Senator Sanders has one really important thing going for him in uh, this whole situation, which is that he actually knows what he wants. He actually has an agenda mm -hmm. and has already been looking for ways to, pa to push that agenda um, every chance that he gets. And Biden doesn't really have an ideology or a vision, and much of the Democratic Party doesn't either. So when you have someone with an ideological agenda up against basically nothing, the person with the ideological agenda actually has a lot of power in that situation. I completely agree. One of the things I've always respected about Bernie is he's not only a populist, but he actually understands policy and procedure. Now he's one of the most powerful people in Washington, Senate, budget, committee chairman. Him and his staff actually know what they're doing. They know how to do reconciliation, put, pull off a lot of legislative tricks. So I actually think he's going to be incredibly, I, I wouldn't say successful to the like 100th percentile, but I think that in the general, if there is like a progressive economic victory, under Biden, it will largely be because of something that he is doing there. Very true. All right. And finally, president of Repairs of the Breach, Reverend Dr. William Barber II, he joined us for an interesting conversation on saving the soul of the nation. He explains one of the five major sicknesses that our country faces, religious nationalism, and why he thinks it's so bad. Well, this is the kind of religious nationalism we have seen that makes an, an idol out of one person that that folk that tries to use religion to justify hate to justify isolation to justify saying that america is better than anyone else and doesn't have to care about anyone else the kind of false nationalism that tends to lead itself also into uh, the sinful realities of racism and ideas of supremacy and what we saw the other day at the Capitol was what always inevitably happens whenever you seed and feed division based in race and based in class and ideas of supremacy. It has always 
ended in violence. Um, you know, you saw people the other day on the Senate floor when they broke in um, to the White House, I mean, to the Capitol, talk, praying, uh, trying to justify their hate in religious terms. That is a form of theological malpractice at best and heresy at worst. But we didn't just, it didn't just happen with Trump. Trump may have lit the gasoline this time. George Wallace lit the gasoline in the 60s and others have lit it. But the gasoline of division was poured out. Reverend Barber made also a really important point in terms of how, and, and by the way, he delivered a beautiful homily um, at the bipartisan prayer inaugural breakfast the day after the inauguration. He actually did that interview with us and then went straight into essentially delivering this homily. So we're really grateful for his time this morning. But, you know, he said to us, nice words aren't enough. Look, the words of a president matter. Um, but sometimes, and this is my own take, not exactly his take, but sometimes Biden seems to think that the words alone, that that's all that matters, that that's sufficient. When in fact, you have to do actual policy, you have to actually change the structural material conditions um, that people face in this country if you are really serious about healing. So healing doesn't just happen from saying the word unity. You actually have to deliver for people and start to heal, literally heal and repair the body of the nation itself and the people in it in order to begin to have that unity that you seek. Yeah, I thought it was a really important point that he made. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you back here soon. That's right. Hit the subscribe button. Don't miss any of our videos. And we will be back tomorrow for another round of Hashtag Rising Cues.